Okay, let's go to our preaching time. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles, please, to the book of Isaiah, chapter 59. Isaiah, chapter 59. And I'm going to read verses 9 through 13 as we begin. Isaiah 59, verses 9 to 13. Therefore is judgment far from us, neither doth justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold obscurity, for brightness, but we walk in darkness. We grope for the wall like the blind, and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as if in the night. We are in desolate places as dead men. We roar all like bears, and mourn sore like doves. We look for judgment, but there is none, for salvation, but it is far off from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us. And as for our iniquities, we know them. In transgressing and lying against the Lord, and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. Israel knew that their poverty and invasion by their enemies were the consequences of them having sinned against God, having lied about God and the laws of God, equating him with the idols of the heathen, and so forth. The Bible declares, let God be true, but every man a liar. Romans 3, verse 4. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. We believe Jesus Christ was and is the divine truth of Almighty God in the form of a man. He was God in human form, born as a man to walk among men, to live among men. He can identify with men. The Bible says that in Jesus Christ, God was manifest in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3, verse 16. Every modern translation has reworded that. None of the modern Bibles say God was manifest in the flesh. They all say he appeared in a body, he was in the flesh, but they don't tell you who was in the flesh. They introduce a subject with no uh, antecedent, no predicate before that to identify who they're getting ready to describe. And the reason that you should take notice of that is because eventually Satan is going to appear in the, in the flesh as the man of sin, the Antichrist. The idea that you don't have to identify who appeared in the flesh, uh, and it's irrelevant to the Christian reading the Bible, it's very relevant, it's very pertinent. And uh, your Bible, if you have a King James Bible, is the only one that says God was manifest in the flesh. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, verse 6. We also believe that the written scriptures are the divine truth of Almighty God, from cover to cover. Christ prayed, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. John 17, verse 17. We call ourselves Bible believers because to us, the Bible is a big deal. We believe that. The Lord didn't give Christians candles to light, and he didn't give us incense to burn. He didn't give us a string of beads or a knotted ropes. So we can count our memorized prayers as we recite them. He didn't give us statues or icons or images of holy people or saints or angels to kneel before, to lay flowers at the statue of the Virgin Mary, or even the Buddha for that matter. God knew what he was doing. He gave us one physical, tangible object to hold in our hands, to touch, to consult when we need answers, the Bible. Beyond that, uh, if you can't find the answers from God here, you're not going to find them in a, 
uh, something from a religious supply store. We even call it the Holy Bible. In fact, it says Holy Bible right on the spine because we believe it has no errors in it. It's completely separate from everything man would put out. There are many unbelievers who have some concept of God. They believe certain things about God that turn out to be false because they're not based in the Scripture. And many people who are believers in Jesus Christ, but they haven't been reading their Bible, they can fall prey to any number of screwball, harebrained ideas as well. God wants you rich. God wants you healthy, wealthy, and so forth. They never get, they never get to the wise part. They're some of the stupidest jerks you'd ever meet. You know, send in your love gift, tuck in your gift, prayer partners, and God will give you back 30, 60, 100 fold for your faithfulness to this ministry, this TV channel. I never read in the New Testament that blessings from God were dependent upon how much you give to a Christian TV network. You won't find it. Um, lay your hand on the screen for a point of contact. Never mind that this was tape, you know, tape delayed. It was recorded six weeks ago, but... Dr. Ruckman used to say, put your hand behind, the, behind this TV set and you'll get a point of contact. <laughs> that was very true. There was a man named Jose Harris, and he wrote this. There is beauty in truth, even if it's painful. Those who lie twist life so that it looks tasty to the lazy, brilliant to the ignorant, and powerful to the weak. But lies only strengthen our defects. They don't teach anything, help anything, fix anything, or cure anything. Nor do they develop one's character, one's mind, one's heart, or one's soul. So I call this sermon today, Four Lies About God. Four Lies About God. Lie number one. God is too mysterious to really understand anything about him. If he's there, he's too mysterious to know him. They say God works in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. And it's the idea that nothing definite can be known about God, or that very little can be known about God. It's the belief of the agnostic. A Gnostic professes to have special knowledge about the spiritual world. I put an A in front of it in Greek, and it reverses the meaning. So an agnostic claims he does not have any certain knowledge about God. The, word, the Greek word agnostic has a Latin equivalent, ignoramus. You can find both of those words in any English dictionary. And uh, it's the lazy man's approach because he doesn't really want to know anything about God because there may be strings attached. God might expect something from me. He might expect some response uh, on my part for that knowledge that I now have, what I, what I now understand about him. Jesus prayed, and this is life eternal, that they know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. John 17, verse 3. Christ prayed that men would have a knowledge of Almighty God and Himself and some expectation of eternal life because of it, because of that knowledge. God's not in the business of hiding Himself and making it difficult for people to find Him. Abraham was called the friend of God in the New Testament, James 2, verse 23. Jesus said to his disciples, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. John 15, verse 15. That's a pretty intimate knowledge of God and of the Lord Jesus. He calls us his friends specifically because he wants to reveal himself to us. Amen. He wants us to know about him and his will and his word. 
The Bible says, For him that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Hebrews 11, verse 6. The Bible doesn't promise that you will know everything there is to know about God. How can the finite understand the infinite? How can one who is limited in time and space understand the creator of time and space? But to say that you can't learn anything about God or he's too mysterious to really understand him um, turns out to be false. After all, the Lord says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Earlier in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. So while we don't pretend to know everything about the Lord God of the Bible, the idea that the God of the Bible is too mysterious, you really can't learn anything about him, is a lie. Lie number two, God doesn't care about the world, specifically the suffering in the world. This is a riddle put forth by atheists. And it goes this way, and it may vary a little bit, but uh, this, is the, this is the crux of it, and this is the main heart of their argument. You Christians say you believe in a God who is all-knowing, who's all-powerful, and who's all-loving. To which every Christian would say, yes, I do. Well, then how do you explain the existence of misery and pain and disappointment and heartache and suffering and tragedy uh, in the world, which attends every person at one point or another, some more, some less? How do you explain the constant presence of evil and sin and pain and destruction and warfare and bloodshed and heartbreak and heartache um, and unhappiness throughout the world. How do you explain the constant presence of that if your God is all of those things? And then they'll say, now, maybe your God is unaware of someone who's doing something bad over here. If that's so, then he's not all-knowing, is he? Maybe he knows about it, but he can't do anything about it. He can't fix it. That means he's not all-powerful. If he knows about it, and he can do something about it, but he decides not to, then he's not all-loving. And uh, most Christians are not prepared to be hit with that argument, so they're not sure how to respond And they think that if they can establish some character flaw in God, in the God that we believe in, then they have destroyed his very existence. They've, they've eliminated his very existence uh, if they can find a character flaw. That means he must not be there after all. But you can't find character flaws in someone who's not there. Their argument actually proves the existence of God. It, it affirms that God must be there. I think their problems are more mental and emotional than they are intellectual. Here's a book. It's um, a collection of essays written by well-known atheists. Bertrand Russell, Anthony Flew, a few others. Anthony Flew actually decided he believed there was a God before he died a few years ago. He was the most prominent atheist in the world at the time. Of course, he never died. He never turned to Jesus Christ as a sinner needing to be saved. So he died and still went to hell. But it's called Critiques of God. Critiques of God. You find anything wrong with that title? You can't critique someone who's not there. You can't find criticisms against God if God doesn't exist. Atheists like to use that line of reasoning to discredit the very existence of God. But as I say, you can't find character flaws in someone who's not there. The Bible's response to this is that it's not God 
who brings about evil and suffering in the world. Man's capable of doing a lot of that all by himself. See, you underestimate the power of men to do evil and to hurt other people. You would insist that you have a free will to make good or bad decisions, good and bad choices throughout the day, throughout life. You might make a good decision, but the guy next to you might make a bad decision and might affect you. People are capable of all kinds of rebellion and sin and wickedness and evil and corruption and harm to one another. James 1.13 tells us, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with, with evil, neither tempteth he any man. The next verse says, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lusts and enticed. Joshua told Israel, choose you this day whom ye will serve, Joshua 24, verse 15. But men have chosen foolishly, and their foolish, stupid decisions have gotten them into a lot of trouble. They've caused harm for other people. They've caused misery for, for people on the job, people in their family, people through the country. You know, you elect the wrong guy to be president and then wonder, how come we're heading towards socialism? Because we elected a whole bunch of jerks that shouldn't have been in the office. I can say jerk now. I mean, if they're not president, the former jerks, right? <laughs> Men have chosen foolishly. The people they marry, the jobs they take, the hobbies they engage in, the things they do in their pastime, the chances and risks they take, the speed they go on the road, any number of things they engage in, they make bad, stupid decisions, and they wonder why it turns out bad. The Bible says earlier in Isaiah 59, about verse 2, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. God's God. God hears everything. But he's not obligated to respond until you make, uh, make uh, approach to him uh, on his terms and deal with the sin problem in your life. God cares about this world, but he's smart enough not to step in and uh, correct every mistake and to, to uh, remedy every sin you're about to engage in. If the Lord stepped in and he intervened every time you're about to do something stupid, then you would get mad at God. Why doesn't he back off a little bit? Why doesn't he let me, you know, stumble and fall? Let me learn from my own mistakes. How am I ever going to grow as a human being? And so God doesn't get involved every time. And you do a lot of dumb things and harm yourself. And God doesn't care. He doesn't step in. You see, God can't win with an attitude like that. There's some people, uh, they're, they're their own worst enemies. And God can't win with that person. The Lord Jesus said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, meaning himself, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, verse 16. You all know that verse. You've seen it on the, uh, past the goalpost on the football games, right? There's always somebody holding that sign up. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, verse 8 says, 1 Peter 5, 7 reminds us, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. The God of the Bible certainly does care about the world. He cares about the suffering that you're going through. He cares about the problems you have. He cares about the distress and the anguish and the worry and the loneliness and the heartbreak and the heartache and the misery and the pain and the physical problems. He cares about all of those things. But if you're not casting all your care upon him, believing that he cares for you, it's easy to become cynical. Say, well, he must not care because he doesn't step in uh, uninvited and fix my problems for me. That's kind of what people want him to do without asking him to do so, without believing in him, without reading his book, without praying to him, without going to church, without trusting Jesus Christ. They still want God to step in uninvited and fix their problems for them. That's not real, uh, realistic. That's not the real world. If you're a parent, you know you can't do that for your children. 
and uh, you know your parents couldn't do it for you all the time. But the idea that God doesn't care is a lie. Lie number three, God doesn't send anyone to hell. That lie is popular with the cults, is popular with the Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, with the Christadelphians, which aren't as well known as the JWs. It's popular with the Seventh-day Adventists, that there is no literal burning hell. Uh, once you die, your soul goes dormant, unconscious, lays in the ground, in the body, in the casket, in the grave, uh, waiting for some future resurrection day. The JWs uh, claimed one of their magazines a few years ago, quote, Hell is not a Bible teaching. And they say the very idea of eternal torment is repugnant to God. And they appeal to certain verses, but they only partially quote them. 2 Peter 3, verse 9, for example, God is not willing that any should perish. They only use that part, right? But that all should come to repentance. 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of those whose heart is perfect toward him. That's to assume everyone's heart is perfect toward him, and therefore he's looking after their good. He's only going to give them good and blessings in the future. That's to uh, accentuate the positive and eliminate the negative, so forth. That old song, Bing Crosby. What about those whose hearts are not perfect towards God? What about those who do not repent of their sins? What's to be done with them? Just let them all in anyway? If you think about, about um, oh, over the last 60, 70 years, there have been a whole lot of brutal, bloody dictators in the world. Most people, when someone says, name somebody who is the embodiment of evil in the in modern times. Most people want to start with the A's and say Adolf Hitler. But Pol Pot, the, I think the Vietnamese killing fields, Saddam Hussein, Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il, Kim Jong-un, whole family of dictators, Fidel Castro, starve his family or starve his uh, nation, Who knows how many millions of people uh, have died prematurely under the reign and regime of any of these kinds of people? Soviet Union, communist uh, leaders, Lenin, Stalin, so forth. Well, since all of those men are dead, then that means they made it to heaven before you did, right? They'll be waiting for you. So can't you wait to get to heaven? They'll be there waiting for you. If everyone goes to heaven, nobody goes to hell, uh, Lord, is there a third place I can go? I don't want to spend eternity with those kinds of people. What's to be done with those? Someone who never does repent. Someone whose heart isn't right with God. It was Christ himself who first coined the expression hellfire. Do you know where he coined that? In the beautiful, lovely Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, verse 22. Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, so forth. He's the first one to use the expression hellfire. Funny, those modern preachers, they never read that part. They only focus on certain phrases contained in that sermon, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and uh, ignore the rest. Christ likened men unto trees that either bring forth good fruit in life, or they bring forth bad fruit. And he warned, every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Matthew 7, verse 19. Not just the fruit, the tree, the person. And Christ spoke to himself as the final judge in his own kingdom one day. Then shall he say unto him, uh, also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, verse 41. There's some real hell's angels that will be there. There's no such thing as a one-sided coin. If you have a coin that's got a face on both sides, you know it's a gimmick. It's a trick. It's a deception. It's not real. It's not legitimate. But there's blessing and comfort for those who die 
with the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and there's torment for those who die without it. That's just the heart of the matter. The idea of hell is not pleasant, but you can't appreciate joy and blessing unless there's hell on the other side. You can't appreciate good goodness unless you are aware of something that's bad and evil. You won't appreciate being in heaven one day as a saint unless some people aren't there and they're in hell. One only has its value in comparison with the other. But to say categorically that God doesn't send anyone to hell is a lie. The fourth lie today is God will welcome anyone who is sincere. God will welcome anybody who is sincere. They might not have known uh, anything about repenting of their sins. They might not have heard the gospel of Christ. They, they may never ha have had a missionary come if they lived in a remote part of the world and so forth. And there are several variations of this. Um, we're all working to get to the same place, aren't we? Um, it doesn't matter what anyone believes as long as they are sincere about it. Um, all paths lead up to the same mountain. Um, all religions are basically true. That last one is a real impossibility. If all religions are basically true, doesn't that mean Christianity is basically true? It's one of the faiths. It's one of the religions, they call it. If all religions are basically true, it means the gospel of Jesus Christ and everything it conveys and promises to the sinner must be basically true. But one of the most fundamental principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that all others are false. Right. There is no other way except by Jesus Christ. Amen. When Joshua told the people, choose you this day whom ye will serve, it automatically implies there's a right choice and a wrong choice. People don't like the gospel of Christ uh, being so exclusive or exclusionary. There's saying that there's no other way except through Jesus Christ. The truth of the matter is that um, God has not only made Jesus Christ, his son, the only way to get back in, to get into heaven and uh, come, come unto the Father, but he's actually made an effort to mock the beliefs of other people. Someone who doesn't realize that is someone who's never read the Bible. Elijah taunted the worshipers of Baal, 1 Kings 18, verse 27. It came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awaked. If he's a god, call out, cry a little louder. King David wrote, The idols of the heathen are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Neither is there any breath in their mouths. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. Psalm 135, verses 15 to 18. In other words, somebody who requires a statue, needs a statue or some image to focus his attention, to make contact with, with the unseen world, the world beyond, the world of God, however he wants to phrase it, someone who needs a statue, an image, is just as spiritually dead as the statue is. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. Think that God wouldn't mock and make fun of the efforts of unbelieving men and unrighteous men to come to God? The Lord Jesus would say, He that entereth not by the door of the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. And he said, all that ever came before me, that would mean Hindu deities, the Buddha, who probably never truly existed, and anyone else. He says, he didn't say, uh, were thieves and robbers, but they are, present tense, thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them, John 10, verses 1 and 8, respectively. So while those founders, those people may be dead and gone, anyone still repeating their lie is also a thief and a robber. The Bible says, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. 
Revelation 14, verse 12. You can't expect God to welcome anyone into heaven just because they were sincere. Hitler was sincere in his beliefs. You watch some of the old newsreels of Adolf Hitler giving a speech to the uh, German uh, throngs of people following him during World War II, late 30s or 1940s. When he gave a speech, he didn't just read a printed script like modern politics. He preached. That guy was animated. He was motivated. He was convicted about what he was saying. He was sincere. But he was sincerely wrong. Billy Graham used to talk about being a boy and his mother gave him medicine for some problem he had. Uh, what she thought was medicine turned out it was some kind of poison. It made him extremely sick. She was sincere, but she was sincerely wrong. Sincerity carries no weight. It means nothing. You can't expect God to welcome someone who was sincere in some other belief other than the Lord Jesus Christ alone and his shed blood. Jesus told the apostles, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, John 14, 6. Peter preached, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Acts 4, verse 12. The Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy and said, There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. 1, Peter, or 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. And the Apostle John wrote, This is the record that God hath given unto us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. 1 John 5, 11 and 12. In fact, verse 12 is one syllable. Every word in that verse is one syllable. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. How much simpler could God have made it? If you're a moron, maybe you still don't get it. But most of you aren't morons, and neither, well, there are a few, I think, that are watching us on the internet, because they're sitting home in their underwear right now. But uh, if you can read a one-syllable word, get a hold of that. Stop trusting what you've been trusting, and trust only in the work of Jesus Christ. The shedding of his blood for your sake, on your behalf, long before I was ever born, Jesus Christ was dying for the sins that I would one day commit. He was judged on my behalf before I was ever conceived by my parents, before they were conceived, before my grandparents and great-grandparents were ever born, that long ago. But the blood he shed on Calvary still is effective now. It's able to save, it's able to cleanse the guilt of my sin, wash me clean from the stain of that sin. You can't expect God to throw out any standards tied to his son Jesus Christ and let anyone in who's just because they're sincere. That'd be like playing a game, playing a sport, but each person making up their own rules. What constitutes fair play? What constitutes a foul? What constitutes a point? What constitutes an error? And so on. You couldn't do that. It'd be nothing but chaos. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So there are four lies about God. God's too mysterious? That's a lie. God doesn't care about the suffering in the world? That's a lie. God doesn't send anyone to hell? That's a lie. And God will welcome anyone if they're sincere? That's a big lie. Amen. 